Hello, everyone. We're going to start the 10 o'clock block of today's conferences. I'm Chris Fitch. I'm a graduate assistant at the graduate school. And uh, your odd microphones and videos are going to be remain off. Any questions can be put into the chat. And our first presenter is Dr. Jordan Brasher, History and Geography at Columbus State University. And he is going to show us about creating Confederate soldiers. So Dr. Brasher, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Chris. Let me share my screen here. Okay, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, I would ask how you're doing, but I have a feeling that a lot of people are not doing so well. I know I personally stayed up really late last night and uh, groveled with my friends over the election for hours into the, into the middle of the night. So I'm, I'm hoarse and I'm tired, but I'm happy to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, I'm gonna be <clears throat> talking to you a little bit <clears throat> about some of my PhD research that I did uh, the last couple of years uh, when I was at the University of Tennessee. Um, and <clears throat> the title of my talk for you today is Creating Confederate Pioneers. <clears throat> I'll tell you what that means. The subtitle is A Spatial Narrative Analysis of Race, Settler Colonialism, and Heritage Tourism at the Museu da Imigração, Santa Bárbara do Oeste, São Paulo. What we're going to talk about, <clears throat> where we're going in the next few minutes that we've got together, is I'm going to give you an introduction to my study site. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some historical background. In particular, I'm going to tell you about who the Confederados are. And if you haven't heard of the Confederados, I encourage you to do a little bit of reading about them uh, after this talk is over. They're an interesting bunch of folks who um, do some really interesting things with their lives. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you some about that. The theoretical lens that I use in this project is settler colonialism. So um, settler colonialism essentially being, you know, the, the creation of a permanent society of settlers on top of indigenous land. Uh, that society typically involves ethnic cleansing and genocide and the replacement of an indigenous population uh, with a population of settlers on their land. Um, <clears throat> the methods that I use in this research project involve uh, what's called spatial narrative analysis, which is, uh, if you're familiar at all with discourse analysis, it's really similar to that, except we, um, we sort of use like a, a, a special sensitivity to space and place as a geographer, um, kind, of, kind of an adaptive discourse analysis. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. I'll tell you about some of the results of the project. So the key sort of <clears throat> study site that we're going to explore is, is a museum in Brazil, in the interior of Sao Paulo, in the city that you heard me pronounce as Santa Barbara do Oeste. Um, so we'll talk about this museum, what it has to do with Confederates that migrated to Brazil, and why it matters, why it might be interesting from both a scholarly perspective, from a... Um, sort of a layperson or citizen perspective from a political and historical perspective. Um, so that's where we're going to go with this talk. So here's my study site. This is the museum <clears throat> in the interior of Sao Paulo. This museum is in a town that is, you know, really not that much bigger than Muskogee County. You know, there's, I mean, maybe about 200,000 people there. Um, it's, this museum is located right in the downtown square. It's housed in a former prison. And um, this is the museum that is going to tell a story about a bunch of Confederates who left the U.S. South after the Civil War and migrated to Brazil. So that's why this Museu da Imigração has that title that it has. That means Museum of the Immigration. And so the whole deal with this museum is that it's designed to tell the story of the immigration of uh, Confederates from the South to Brazil, okay? And that is, that story that the museum tells is the subject of analysis in my talk today and in, uh, in this research that I have been doing. And so just to, <clears throat> to orient you a little bit, this is the region of Brazil in which this research takes place. Um, as you can see, Santa Barbara do Oeste is just a little bit outside of Sao Paulo, about two hours by bus. Uh, 
And I also highlight another city right there next to it called Americana because both of these cities were actually settled by Confederate soldiers and their families. And so they both, you know, figure really uh, prominently and, and kind of make up the study area of my dissertation research, which focused on sort of how these Confederate descendants think of themselves and what um, locally some of the politics are around commemorating the Confederacy. Um, so that, that's my, my study site there. And by the way, <clears throat> I noticed that I have at least one of my geography students from World Regional Geography who is on this call. I wanna just take an opportunity to remind you that if you're interested in creating maps like this and learning how to work with uh, what's called GIS technology, geographic information systems technology. Uh, I encourage you to sign up for my intro to GIS class in the spring, and you can actually learn how to make maps like this uh, and even more interesting maps for yourself. But <clears throat> here's, here's the historical background. Here is a little bit about the Confederados. So at the end of the Civil War, rather than face reconstruction, and the possibility of incorporating formerly enslaved black people into Southern society. Several thousand, we think between eight and 10,000, some estimates say more, uh, Confederates migrated to Brazil. And this is important because Brazil was a country that in 1865 at the end of the US Civil War had yet to abolish slavery. Brazil would actually be the last holdout in the Americas to formally abolish slavery. Uh, in 1888, so another, not until another 23 years after the end of the U.S. Civil War. Now, <clears throat> many of these descendants who migrated to Brazil still today in the year of our Lord 2020, well, not this year because, um, because of COVID, but regularly, annually conduct uh, and put on this festival in which they celebrate their Confederate heritage. And this festival is no small feat, it's no small event. It typically attracts more than 2000 visitors and tourists to the region. And a lot of those tourists end up going to this museum, which I am analyzing uh, here in this talk today. One thing that's, that's interesting about this historical background and what kind of drew me to the research is that historical accounts that have sort of chronicled this Confederate migration have taken an approach of kind of memorializing it rather than critically analyzing this Confederate migration. And in particular, they've really excluded the role of racism and the role of slavery in creating the conditions for the migration. So what I wanted to do with my work was bring a more critical edge to how scholars and lay people understand the Confederate migration to Brazil, why these Confederates chose to do this, <clears throat> what were the conditions that created the migration? And what can we learn sort of about the transnational dimensions of settler colonialism, white supremacy, um, and sort of the, the politics of memory today? Um, and so, yeah, in this study, I explore the representation of this history of the migration to Brazil in this particular museum. Okay, and here is, I just wanted to include this photo to give you, this is a photo from my field work kind of a little bit of a sample of what I'm talking about and the and kind of a, a zoom in briefly to the world of the Confederados because I took this photo in April of 2019 when I was at the, the Confederate Heritage Festival uh, that takes place every year in Santa Barbara do Oeste. It's a festival called the Festa Confederada which means Confederate Party or Confederate Festival and what you'll notice is that in this particular moment in the festival you can see all of these tourists crowded around the main stage area. And in the stage area, um, you'll see men in gray Confederate uniforms and women in these bright uh, sort of flowing yellow antebellum era, uh, what we might call bell hoop dresses. And each of the men in their, in their gray uniforms has, is, is holding a state flag from one of the 13 Confederate States of America. And uh, what they're doing actually in this particular moment is doing a presentation of the flags of all of the states. So they come out on stage with the flags, they show the flags off. Um, and then after they put the flags away, they do a lot of dancing and singing. They dance to, you know, Brad Paisley and Lady Annabellum and 
Johnny Cash and they, they do the two step and they square dance. Um, and so they, they sort of incorporate a lot of traditional kind of Southern cultural elements into much of the festival. Um, and you can see um, sort of back on the left, there's a, a Confederate monument there. Um, and further back, there's a little chapel there that would be um, sort of a, a little Protestant church that some of the first Confederate migrants um, built. And, and back behind that chapel is actually a cemetery. So the broader sort of geographical context of what you're looking at is uh, a cemetery actually that for much of the year is typically sort of a place of, of solemnness, a place for Confederate descended people to go and kind of pay respects to their ancestors. But then in this one weekend every year, it's transformed into this wild party uh, where they celebrate the Confederacy. And if you know anything about Brazil, you know people in Brazil love parties and love festivals. So um, it, it, while it might seem strange to dance and sing and play loud music in a cemetery for many of us, um, I mean, that's just kind of the way that it goes there. But anyways, I just wanted to give you a, a sort of a quick snapshot of some of the, um, the broader things that are going on, not just in the museum, but kind of in, in the area to commemorate and celebrate uh, this Confederate heritage, okay? So the theoretical lens that I want to briefly frame this project within today is the lens of settler colonialism. And <clears throat> I think it's important that, uh, that I frame it this way because this is, this, is how, this is how I believe that it makes most sense to interpret and understand the way that the museum talks about this particular um, phenomenon. Uh, this particular story. So settler colonialism is a form of colonialism that seeks to replace, especially through ethnic cleansing and genocide, the originous, original indigenous population of a colonized territory with a new society of settlers. And this would be different than historically something like merchant capitalism in which, uh, or merchant colonialism in which European colonists went to various places on the African continent or in India or wherever and just sort of conducted trade and exploited resources from a place. Settler colonialism is really about creating a new society on top of indigenous land of settlers. Uh, and so settler societies include places like the United States, Australia, Israel, even Kenya and Argentina. Uh, settler societies exist around the world. I theorize in this paper and in this research project Confederados is what I call settlers twice over because they're white European descended settlers in the United States who settled once in the US who then migrated and settled a second time yet again in Brazil. Um, and within this paper, again, I'm analyzing how the museum's narrative, including especially the spatial arrangement of exhibits constructs what I call a Confederate pioneer or a settler narrative. Um, and so I'll talk to you a little bit more about what that narrative looks like. But here, let me say something about this particular method of spatial narrative analysis, okay? Because I think it's important to understand in the, in the context of this paper. Spatial narrative analysis is a type of discourse analysis that understands texts on exhibits as not the only kinds of texts that contribute to the overall narrative within a museum, okay? So um, in other words, when you go into a museum and you start to read the, the exhibits, read the plaques and look at the, um, the exhibits that you see there, the words that you read on the plaques are not the only form of text that are involved in telling a story at the museum, okay? And so spatial narrative analysis understands the museum as this bigger assemblage this larger collection of objects, artifacts, narratives, bodies, labor, materials, et cetera, that contribute to the museum's narrative. It also considers the spatial aspects. This is kind of the key spatial geographic part of this method. It considers the spatial aspects of commemorative sites as critical participants in structuring the site's narrative. And so what I mean by that is um, I take a really close look at which parts of the museum are, fo are focused in the center of the story. Whose artifacts, whose materials, whose information, whose life stories are in the very center of the museum's narrative and the story that they tell. 
And who's, by contrast, are on the periphery? Whose narratives are de-emphasized or ignored or erased or marginalized or placed in the literal physical periphery of the exhibits and also perhaps in the ideological periphery of the exhibits and texts, okay? So that's what I mean by spatial narrative analysis. So the key research question that I ask here is, how does this museum represent the history of the Confederate migration to Brazil? Okay, we know from historical detail, from historical research, from primary sources that, um, okay, great, thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> We know from, from historical information that slavery was a key motivating factor for the, the Confederates choosing to migrate to Brazil. Does the museum talk about that at all? Does the museum discuss racism and slavery? My findings suggest that the museum emphasizes the artifacts and experiences of white settlers. It mentions enslavement only once in all of the exhibits in the museum and that it crafts an image of the confederados as brave pioneers. And in fact, in Portuguese, the word pioneiros, pioneers, is used repeatedly over and over and over again to describe the sort of swashbuckling, devastated, defeated confederates as pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, you know, um, bringing about, you know, living out this pioneer mentality and, uh, you know, migrating to Brazil uh, to start a better lives, life for themselves. And so what I want you to notice in these images here is the centrality of um, Confederate sort of clothes and um, utensils and items that are sort of placed in the center of the, of the museum. And then all around, you'll see exhibits on the margins. Look in the bottom image before I move on briefly and look in the the far right side of the bottom image, there's kind of a shadow cast in the corner over there. So that dark, unilluminated shadow in the corner of the museum, sort of not at all in the spatial or ideological center of the story is the only mention of slavery in the entire museum. So I'll use that as sort of a key point in making my argument about the marginalization and the romanticization of slavery in this museum. And here is the one instance in which slavery is mentioned. Uh, and I wish I had more time. Sadly, I, I'm already running low on time. But what I'll tell you is that there, there are some, some quotes here that are interesting for you to think about uh, in terms of the museum. I, I interviewed the museum's art educator. Okay, so the museum is so small that there's not formal conducted, formally conducted tour guides. But the art educator by her own admission says that here it's very romanticized in the museum, but she says it needs to be left that way because the Civil War wasn't a good war. One of the exhibits that promotes the kind of pioneer narrative that I argue exists in the museum is this. It says deeply humiliated morally and financially, many preferred to heed their pioneer instincts, abandoning their lands in search of new horizons. So again, kind of this swashbuckling bootstraps narrative about who the Confederates were uh, without any mention of slavery as, as a key motivating factor in the migration. Um, again, and, and then a quote at the bottom says, rigorously studied, one can consider all of Brazilian history as an immigration phenomenon. Effectively, what is our history if not a process of peopling a large territory that 15th and 16th century European navigators found almost deserted? Uh, and I emphasize that almost deserted part because a key tenet of settler colonialism is an inability to see indigenous occupation of land as a legitimate existence in the world, geographically, politically, historically. And so um, the fact that the museum is still promoting this kind of colonial narrative that South America was completely deserted and there weren't any indigenous people there when they arrived is a, a prime example of settler colonialism. And what I'll say about the image in this slide is that you can see there's uh, an image of a lone man kind of in the left side there. He is an, thought to be an enslaved person, but the only information about him uh, in the photo is that he's described as escravo or slave. Uh, and there's no information at all about his life. 
There's no attempt to make any connection between the Confederate migration and the broader issue of slavery in Brazil or in the United States. He's simply there with a picture and he's sort of dehumanized and not really, um, not really, there's no, there's just nothing given about his life, about his information. It's just labeled kind of reduced to the identity of a slave. Okay. So I know that I have to wrap up now. So what I'll say about the broader impacts that I hope to accomplish from this research is that I hope for it to contribute to a broader public perspective on the history and geography of Confederate memory, right? We typically think about issues related to the politics of Confederate memory and monuments as being uh, restricted to the US South or perhaps the United States more broadly. I'm arguing that we actually need a transnational approach to understanding Confederate memory, settler colonialism, and white supremacy. Um, I, I hope to develop a greater uh, understanding of the transnational dimensions of white supremacy and settler colonialism in museums and at festivals. I hope that this work that I'm doing here is, is useful for museum managers and cultural tourism planners who are seeking to improve the best practices for representing difficult pasts and avoiding re-entrenching dominant ways of remembering or romanticizing those difficult histories, okay? And uh, I also wanna challenge the romanticized historical accounts of the Confederate migration and settlement that ignore or suggest that the settlement had nothing to do with slavery. Where you can read more about this research and because I only had 20 minutes, I, I didn't cover much, uh, covered in much detail. Where you can read the full study, it's published in the Journal of Heritage Tourism uh, under the same title that I gave today for the talk. So if you'd like to learn more about it, uh, you can check it out there in the Journal of Heritage Tourism. Or you can just email me at brasher underscore Jordan at columbusstate.edu and I'll send you a PDF of it. Uh, also, you know, check me out on Twitter uh, as well at JP Brasher and we can connect and talk more. But I think I've reached my 20 minute timeline, sadly, so I'm going to stop right there. Thank you, Dr. Brasher. We have a question. Uh, how did people there respond to your presence and research agenda? Were there any people resistant to your project? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Banks for that question. Uh, there were a lot of people who were really, really resistant to me being there and doing this work. In fact, uh, when I was planning to do the portion of my research project dedicated to understanding the festival itself, um, I showed up with a team of researchers to the festival uh, and all of our equipment to, to do recordings of tourists who were visiting the festival. And, and I had gotten what I thought was prior permission um, to do the research there. And yet when I showed up, the festival organizers actually kept me and my team from doing any work because they had found out through the grapevine that we were gonna ask tourists about their motivations for going to the festival. And we were gonna ask them if they could make any connections between the festival and the history and memory of slavery. And so we actually got uh, banned from doing the full scope of research that I had planned to do initially. Um, so yes, there was a ton of resistance there. I mean, there were also, there was also admittedly resistance from even some of the Afro-Brazilian people who were um, protesting the festival as well. There were factions within the Afro-Brazilian groups who took issue with me being a white gringo coming down there and inserting myself within this political conflict and who thought that it wasn't my place to do this research and who um, even at one point purposefully tried to sabotage my research project. I write more about that in an issue, uh, a special issue of the Journal of Cultural Geography, which came out earlier this year, in which the, the special issue talks about <laughs> when uh, what happens in the field in research doesn't meet your expectations and, uh, and the, sort of the idea of fieldwork failure. So I talk a little bit about how I negotiated my positionality in the field uh, in that piece in the Journal of Cultural Geography, which I can also send to anyone who's interested. Um, I see also, Chris, I'm just gonna follow up with the next question. I see my student, Abby, has a question. I don't know if I missed it, but who made the museum? Was it the descendants of Confederados or other people? That's a great question, Abby. And the folks who organized this museum were mostly Confederate descendants. Um, there's an, or it's, and, and it's the, there's a, this organization that um, is involved both with the organization of the festival and also the same organization was involved with creating the museum. They're called the Fraternidade Descendência Americana, which means the Fraternity of American Descendants. And 
they, um, they, in conjunction with members of the local sort of tourism ministry and the local, uh, local leaders from Sao Paulo and in the city where the museum was created, sort of together actually organized this, uh, this museum. But it's an important question, Abby, because it speaks to the question of who has the power to actually talk about and organize um, the way that we think about the past. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's, that's why it narrates this story in the way that it does, because it's, it's a story being told explicitly by the descendants of the enslavers, the descendants of the Confederates. And so they are, you know, making a pretty bold attempt to uh, represent their family and heritage in a positive light uh, and ignore issues of slavery and settler colonialism. Thank you very much, Dr. Brasher. That was a very fascinating presentation. Thank you. I wish I, I had more time. I'm sorry that I, I didn't really get as much in as I wanted to, but I thank you guys for being patient with me. Next up will be Dr. Gary Sprayberry, History and Geography for Columbus State University. And his is Guns, Man, That's the Answer, the FBI, Charles Grimm, and the Campaign to Undermine the Anti-War Movement at the University of Alabama. 1970. So, all right. All right. Us. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to see or sort of see everyone today. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to our breakout room and, and coming to the conference. I'm going to share my screen. Um, everyone can see that. That's okay. Yes. Okay, cool. This is what I'm about to present is uh, um, an article I'm working on. Uh, it's sort of been a side project for uh, a year or so. And um, so what you're going to hear are just excerpts from, from this article. And I'd love some feedback uh, from you. So I'm just going to jump into it. Um, among the former students who participated in the May 1970 anti-war demonstrations at the University of Alabama, Stories about Charles Grimm are legion. Some claim he was an agent provocateur working for the FBI. Others maintain he was simply an informant or narc for local police. A few dismiss him as a nutcase and loose cannon. But they all agree on one thing. On May 6, 1970, hours after students organized the candlelight vigil to honor the dead at Kent State, Grimm set fire to Dressler Hall an old wooden gymnasium, giving Alabama Governor Albert Brewer an excuse to send 100 state troopers to campus to quell demonstrations. A few days after the Dressler fire, police arrested Grimm, a member of the UA wrestling team, and charged him with failing to obey an officer's command, but he mysteriously disappeared from campus before his arraignment. Over the next several months, ACLU attorneys and members of the underground press reported that Grimm had been secretly working for the FBI and had intentionally set fire to Dressler Hall. They also revealed that Grimm had incited violence on other occasions at the university. It was all part of an elaborate plot, they claimed, to undermine the student anti-war movement at UA. My presentation will seek to un unravel the mystery behind Grimm's disappearance, describe his involvement with the FBI and the police, and explain how his actions shaped the official response to the May 70 demonstration. First, I'm gonna give you a little background. On May 6, 1970, two days after National Guardsmen shot and killed four students at Kent State University, anti-war protests erupted on the campus of the University of Alabama. Hundreds of students fanned out across the university quad, chanting anti-war slogans and singing protest songs. Large groups of demonstrators gathered beneath the balcony of the residence of President David Matthews, heckling the administrator for his staunch conservatism and his recent efforts to squelch free speech on campus. He had recently canceled an, on, uh, an appearance by Abby Hoffman on campus. Afterwards, dozens of students marched into the middle of University Avenue and staged a sit-in protest, blocking traffic along the busy thoroughfare. Another group marched on the Student Union Building, occupying it for more than 12 hours, liberating countless ice cream sandwiches and soft drinks from the cafeteria. As night wore on and tempers flared, someone, most likely Charles Grimm, set fire to Dressler Hall. The next morning, more than 100 state troopers were ordered to the campus by Governor Brewer to disperse the student demonstrations. When the 
Troopers arrived on campus, they immediately made their presence felt, donning riot gear and driving loitering students from the quad. They remained on campus for several days, menacing the, the protesters, intimidating students and faculty alike. They were pugnacious, ob obnoxious, very self-righteous, remembered one student. They knew they had God, George Wallace, and Albert Brewer on their side, and they weren't taking anything off anybody. That was kind of scary. They seemed to be a bit out of control. With the troopers' support, President Matthews ordered a curfew, ordered a ban on all assemblies, and urged students to remain calm in the trying days ahead. Few heeded his words. For several days after, the campus played host to countless demonstrations as students and faculty alike added their voices and bodies to the expanding protest. After the May 6 demonstrations, students presented Matthews with a list of demands, which included the removal of special rules governing female students, the lifting of speaker bans, and the creation of a Black Studies program. On May 13th, after Matthews refused to concede to these demands, protests once again engulfed the campus. Hundreds of students congregated at the Student Union Building and refused to obey police orders to disperse. Shouting matches ensued between the demonstrators and pro-administration students. Just after 11 o'clock, police, police waded into a crowd of protesters. There's the Dressler Hall fire. Um, waded into a crowd of protesters swinging nightsticks, grabbing fistfuls of hair and knocking many to the ground. Many of the protesters who tried to escape were pursued across campus, beaten, and then shoved into police cars. The student newspaper, the Crimson White, likened the officers to vicious, hungry wolves in search of blood. One student, Richard Winstead, a member of the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity, arrived at the Deke House with his date just as police were pursuing students from the quad. Members of the fraternity stood out on the frat house lawn watching the drama unfold. Several police officers formed a wedge and headed down University Boulevard toward the Deke House. Without provocation, they marched headlong into the group of onlookers, beating anyone who stood in the way. One of the officers hit Richard Winstead's date in the back of the head. When Winstead protested, five or six officers tackled him and pounded him with nightstick. More than 50 students were arrested during the protest and dozens were injured. According to most accounts, only one phrase could aptly describe what had happened, police riot. The brutal attacks on the evening of May 13th were a turning point for the movement at UA. Before this, the protest had been confined to a relatively small group of activists. The beating of Winstead and other fraternity brothers, however, united liberal and conservative students against the police and school administrators. That was the solidarity on this campus, one professor remembers. The freaks and the frats both joined against this nonsense. One fraternity member said, you know, we never believed the black students about police brutality. We thought the freaks deserved whatever they got. Now it's close to home. Strange things began to occur across campus. One journalist reported that sorority women were now leaning from windows and yelling, pig, pig, the passing police cars. Student D David Lowe, a self-described hippie long hair, rode his motorcycle past the Deke House a few days after the violence of May 13th. He stopped at a traffic light in front of the house and noticed several fraternity brothers out on the lawn. He raised his fist in the revolutionary salute, something he would not have dreamed of doing just two weeks prior. To his astonishment, the Deeks turned and raised their fists in solidarity. The ground had clearly shifted at the university. Over the next few weeks, with a unified student body standing firm against the administration, President Matthews had no choice but to start listening to the students and implementing many of their demands. In most accounts of the protests at UA, this newfound solidarity between the freaks and frats is given most, much of the credit for ushering in social change at the university. For years, a relatively small group of radical students have been challenging the administrations of David Matthews and his predecessor, Frank Rose, demanding fewer restrictions on free speech and more power for student government. Realizing that such students lacked influence across campus, the presidents could easily and effectively ignore them. But now with conservative and liberal students united against the administration, Matthews softened his stance. This account isn't necessarily wrong, but it leaves out a very important part of the story, the actions of Charles Grimm. Grimm, a husky curly haired wrestling champion from San Diego first arrived at the university in the fall of 68. He came to UA on an athletic scholarship. In November 1968, Grimm was suspended from the wrestling team for disciplinary reasons and later placed on academic probation. 
He had allegedly used lighter fluid to burn obscenities into the carpet of a dorm room. Grimm also reportedly broke into a female dormitory. During the May 70 demonstrations, Grimm became a very vocal and active participant. The police arrested him twice, once for refusing to obey an officer's command to leave an unlawful assembly and another time for violating a curfew order. When officers took Grimm into custody the first time, he was carrying a poster of a pig on a crucifix and waving an American flag. Police also arrested Grimm's fiance, Sharon Griney, and charged her with petty larceny. Officers had caught her siphoning gasoline from an automobile. Grimm and dozens of other students arrested during the, the protest were represented by a team of ACLU attorneys that included Jack Drake and George Dean. In July, while other student protesters were preparing to defend themselves against a variety of charges, Grimm abruptly withdrew from the University of Alabama and moved away from Tuscaloosa with his fiance. Two months later, in September 1970, attorneys Drake and Dean held a press conference in downtown Tuscaloosa. They began with a prepared statement. On Thursday, the 10th of September 1970, we attempted to raise in a local trial of a university student certain issues related to the activities of an undercover informant who worked for the Tuscaloosa Police and the FBI during the disturbances at the university last spring. Since our attempts were unsuccessful and since the lives and futures of so many young people are at stake, we have adopted this means to communicate to the people of Alabama the story of almost incredible misconduct on the part of local law enforcement officials, unquote. The attorneys began laying out a timeline of Grimm's activities in the spring of 1970. They based their accounts on hundreds of photographs and documents and on interviews with more than 200 witnesses. They alleged that the FBI and Tuscaloosa police had recruited Grimm at some point before the Kent State demonstrations to infiltrate the local anti-war movement and to provoke students into committing acts of violence. The attorneys dropped Grimm as a client as soon as they learned of his activities. Apparently, the Tuscaloosa police had arrested Grimm for drug possession a few days before the May demonstrations and began using him to make purchases from local dealers. His efforts led to the arrest of 13 people on narcotics charges. After the commencement of the anti-war demonstrations, the FBI recruited Grimm to infiltrate the student movement. Attorneys Drake and Dean even provided some tantalizing evidence to support this claim. They said that when Grimm withdrew from school back in July, he provided a forwarding address to a school counselor, P.O. Box 85, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. A few days before the ACLU press conference, FBI agent Eric Wilson testified in open court that his office mailing address was P.O. Box 85, the same address Grimm had given to the school. When an ACLU attorney asked the agent if he knew Charles Grimm, Wilson refused to answer on the grounds that the question involved official FBI business. The attorneys then turned to Grimm's violent activities during the May protest. On the night of May 6, while students occupied the student union building, he allegedly set fire to Dressler Hall. He even bragged about it to fellow students. That same night, Grimm told another group that guns were needed and that he, he could procure guns for use in fighting the police. The students ignored it. A week later, on May 14th, Grimm tossed six Molotov cocktails that he had fashioned from king-size Coca-Cola bottles into the street in front of an apartment complex. The resultant blaze attracted police to the area. They began beating and arresting students on the scene. A few hours later, Grimm set fire to an abandoned house on Hargrove Alley. Flames consumed half the structure before the arrival of the fire department. At some point in mid-May, Grimm also started attending meetings of the so-called Faculty Student Coalition the primary vessel for organizing the protests and later negotiating with university officials. According to several accounts, the former wrestler urged members of the coalition to, quote, take to the streets and avenge the vicious beatings inflicted on students. Guns, man, that's the answer, he told them. Finally, on the night of May 18th, Grimm threw a bicycle pedal, a softball, and a brick at a group of police officers gathered beneath the balcony of the student union building. Afterwards, Major John Cloud of the Alabama Highway Patrol declared an unlawful assembly and ordered his officers to move in and start making arrests. More than 40 students were hauled away to jail. Grimm, as he had in each of these incidents, somehow managed to avoid arrest. We three lawyers are not overwhelmingly interested in seeing Charlie Grimm prosecuted for the crimes he committed in Tuscaloosa, the attorney said. We have talked with Grimm at length and it is our opinion that he needs professional psychiatric assistance. 
Notwithstanding that conclusion, we are available for discussions with the district attorney if he desires to talk with us. However, we all should remember who hired Charlie Graham and who told him what to do. The FBI and certain T Tuscaloosa City Police are the real criminals in this sordid mess. They found Charlie Grimm, they manipulated him, they played upon his weakness, they abused his humanity, they in effect destroyed him. As soon as the press conference ended, news outlets around the country began a frantic search for Charles Grimm. Reporters from the LA Times and the Tuscaloosa News eventually tracked him down in Minnesota, where he had been living and driving a bakery truck since leaving Tuscaloosa. He admitted to the reporters that he had served as an informant for the FBI, but he was adamant that he had not set fire to Dressler Hall or any other building on campus. And he gave conflicting reports about his whereabouts during the May 6th demonstration. In his interview with the LA Times, Grimm said that he, he had indeed witnessed the Dressler Hall fire, but had not participated. Um, and when he spoke to the Crimson White a few, few days later, he claimed to have been at work when the old gymnasium burned to the ground. Grimm maintained that George Dean, one of the attorneys, knew about his intentions to leave Tuscaloosa back in July. I wanted to leave the state, he said. Uh, I didn't want the six months hard labor. He knew I was leaving. When asked why his former attorneys would accuse him of committing violent acts during the May demonstrations, Grimm said, I don't know. I really don't. I thought it would be better to run out. I guess Dean got teed off. He told the Crimson White, the school newspaper, that he had no desire to return to Alabama. He was afraid that one of the people he had framed for selling drugs would come looking for him. Somebody's gonna, gonna shoot me, he said. Apparently, Grimm never did return to Tuscaloosa to stand trial. As far as we know, he remained in, in Minnesota where his newlywed wife, Sharon, took a job at a hospital and Grimm continued to drive a bakery truck. Most of the charges against the 150 students arrested in the protest were dropped. In fact, only six were ever convicted. Of their, for their roles in the uprising. On October 6, 1971, the PBS program Great American Dream Machine planned to run a 12-minute segment on Grimm and two other men accused of working for the FBI and fomenting violence in order to entrap radicals and justify police actions. The two other bombers, David Sands and Jeff Desmond, had been instructed by the FBI agent to blow up a post office and, and bridge in Seattle. Yet hours before its scheduled broadcast, PBS pulled the plug on the segment. The Seattle Intelligencer reported that FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and the Seattle Police Department had vehemently denied the charges and then pressured PBS to cancel the program. A 12-minute segment of piano music aired instead. PBS executives denied they had canceled the program due to pressure from the FBI. Rather, they had postponed the program to give the writer and filmmaker Paul Jacobs additional time to produce more evidence to corroborate his reporting. But he never got the chance. On October 8, 1971, two days after the program's original air date, WNET Channel 13 in New York City ran the entire 12-minute segment. A few days later, a PBS affiliate in Los Angeles aired the program as well. The segment began with the three men, Sands, Desmond, and Grimm, describing how the FBI had instructed them to detonate bombs or start fires to give police an excuse to crack down on radicals. Eric Wilson, the FBI agent, he told me to burn the buildings, Grimm said in his interview with Jacobs. The reason he wanted me to burn the buildings was so that the state troopers could have an excuse to come on campus and crush the rebellion. After the three men provided their brief introductory descriptions of their actions, Jacobs, the, the writer and the director of this, of this segment, appeared on screen. The FBI involved in bombings and arson? It sounds incredible, he said. I'm Paul Jacobs, a writer, and I've been covering this story for several months. Three young men you just saw insist they committed criminal acts with the knowledge of the FBI. They claim that while working as undercover agents, they tried to provoke violence. They claim uh, so that the police and the FBI would have an excuse to arrest the radicals. The FBI has denied these accusations, calling them totally and absolutely false. And the agents say the charges are also malicious and libelous. The 12 minute segment on the Great American Dream Machine was apparently the final chapter in the Charles Grimm saga. The former wrestler never returned to Tuscaloosa to stand trial for his actions, so member, members of the university community were denied the opportunity to hear his testimony under oath. His actions and his appearance on PBS have been the objects of speculation ever since. Most agree that Grimm set the fire that consumed Dressler Hall, but they disagree on his role in the larger story in the larger story. At a 2010 gathering to commemorate the May 1970 demonstrations, 
Attorney Jack Drake, who authored the ACLU statement that first labeled Graham an agent provocateur, was surprisingly circumspect in his remarks. I don't today believe that Charlie Graham was an agent provocateur in the sense that he enjoyed the protection of the FBI and was committing crimes, although he certainly set Dressler on fire, he said. That's a good story, and I'm the one who wrote the press release 40 years ago that told it, and I believed every word I wrote at the time, but I don't think that's what happened now. Charlie Graham was just a loose cannon. Others disagreed. Tommy Stevenson, a reporter for the Tuscaloosa News, was, was unequivocal about Grimm's actions. Without the nefarious acts of Grimm, he wrote, the arrest, the heads cracked by the police, the overnight occupation of the student union building, and especially the torching of Dressler Hall may never have happened. Almost done. Uh, most people familiar with the case tend to agree with Stevenson. Without Grimm's actions, Governor Brewer may not have felt the urgency to send 100 officers to UA, and they would not have attacked students on the night of May 13th. But until new evidence comes to light, we may never know the full extent of Grimm's activities and his relationship with the FBI and local police. All across the country, individuals like Grimm were infiltrating student organizations, inciting violence and spreading discord among the activists giving the Nixon administration and local authorities an excuse to intervene. If Grimm actually did work as an agent provocateur, he would not have been the first. But his actions still deserve further scrutiny. There are dozens of former UA students who are interested in exposing the parties who are actually responsible for the violence that marred their peaceful protest after the Kent State shootings. They want and deserve answers to the questions that have troubled them since 1970. Who was Charles Grimm and who put him up to it? Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sprayberry. You guys can place any questions in the Q&A. So the implications of your research are kind of terrifying. What do you think the biggest limitation to them is going to be? Um, the biggest limitation is is finding a connection between Charles Grimm and the FBI. They're sort of they're they're these, you know, they're they're um, I guess you could call connections like uh, the fact that the FBI agent gave the same address as Charles Grimm brave gave when he left the university. Those those kind of tantalizing bits of evidence as I described them. Um, but my my suspicion is that he was working in some way for COINTELPRO. He may not have known that, but COINTELPRO or the counterintelligence program in the 60s and 70s, really, they infiltrated a lot of anti-war groups and new left organizations like SDS, even the Black Panthers, and tried to destroy these organizations from within. Now, COINTELPRO had been created back in 56 to um, really kind of neutralize any threats to national security on the right or the left. But in the 60s or 70s, they focused primarily on new left organizations. Um, and I, I think they probably had a lot to do with Grimm's activities. I think it was probably a directive from on high to infiltrate the local movement and discredit it and ultimately destroy it. But it's it's going to be tough to find those records. There's no F I, I, Tried to get an FBI file on Grimm. Um, nothing, nothing there. It's not like they didn't say they didn't have one. They just said it's it's not available to researchers because I think Grimm is still alive, and I need to track him down as well, which has been difficult. Uh, I've, I've made some embarrassing phone calls over the last year <laughs> to people named Charles Grimm, who told me, uh, "No, that's not me." Um, so I'm still trying to track him down. So that's that's part of the. You know, that's part of the trouble as well. We have a question. Like series from pitch. That's, uh, yeah, you'll have to help me write that, uh, Dr. Banks. Well, that, that could be a good Netflix series. Netflix will make anything into a series. That's true. So do you think that this had any resounding impacts afterwards, after the events itself outside of the University of Alabama campus? I think his actions led to, you know, the governor sending in police, sending in, coming in with an iron fist. And, and what it did was, as I described, united liberal and conservative students, and it forced the president to start giving in to demands, like more representation on 
um, student and student government uh, and on the university council they had created they did create a black studies program they started hiring more African American professors. Um, so there, there was some, you know, they, they lifted bans on free speech because they weren't allowing anyone provocative or controversial to come on campus at all. It, was, it all had to be approved by the university. They sort of eased up on that. Um, so there, there were a lot of, you know, their whole list of things, but um, I, I think his actions in the long run served the students well because of the police coming in with a heavy hand and, and really giving all the power and influence to the students after that because of their reckless actions. We have one final question from Dr. Banks. Have you run into any unforeseen problems with your oral history approach on this? Uh, I've only, for this particular project, I've only talked to two or three people and they were students involved in the, um, in the protest themselves. So I'm, I'm getting their point of view on this obviously. And, um, and they're, they're all pretty adamant that Charles Graham was, was behind this, that he had been put up by the police and, and, and FBI. So no problems there. I think when I try to talk to some, maybe some, if there are any police officers uh, around, that might be an issue, uh, who knows? But I, I imagine I'm not gonna get anywhere with you know, federal, the federal government trying to find any kind of information on this. Again, thank you for your presentation. Thank you everyone for attending. We're going to take a 10 minute break until the 11 o'clock meetings. Thanks everybody.